Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of NBS. This episode will be a bit of a shorter broadcast for us, but we will be going over the recently concluded judicial election, as well as the uh, nearing its conclusion, the court case, the North Pacific versus St. George. Uh, joining me for our brief roundtable news session is Bob Arino. Hello, that's me. And Chipoli. Hello, Bob. So just as a bit of a brief overview um, before we dig into some of the numbers is that this election, as per the results that the election commission provided, uh, there was a total of 61 valid votes. Of course, that is down from the number that the general election got a, a couple months back, but usually judicial elections do suffer a bit of a downturn. But still, 61 uh, votes, 61 ballots, not bad at all. Um, of course, one of those ballots not included in the 61 was disqualified because it wasn't a ballot vote. So technically 62 people replied, but you know, you have you have 61 ballot votes. So yeah, I would say that's a decently healthy number. Uh, so going on, we had four candidates for justice this election. Of course, that being uh, Pele, aka Ghost, Iluvatar, uh, Attempted Socialism, and Wolf. All of, all of which, might I add, have served as a justice in the past. But, of course, three seats, four candidates. Looks like we have an election on our hands. So, just a, a bit by the numbers, of course, um, of those 61 votes, six of those voters actually chose to reopen nominations, whereas, uh, you know, the vast majority of them did not want to do so. So, yeah, of course, Ron wasn't triggered. And it actually went through three rounds of voting. Of course, each round determining who gets one seat, and then the the, the candidates who didn't achieve a seat um, gets the next seat. The first seat was won by Paley. The second seat was won by Iluvatar. And the third seat was won by Attempted Socialism. Of course, Lore being the odd man out. To either of the uh, guests joining me, does Lore being the odd man out really... Is, did you find that to be a surprising result? Um... No, um, I think the expected result went ahead as it happened. Um, so I think the three justices were, I think, already on the court prior to the start of this election. And Lord made the choice, I was correct, no, Lord made the choice to not post a campaign while the three other candidates did. So I think that automatically put them as a, at a disadvantage. Um, and, you know, um, Ilovater, Attempt of Socialism, and Palaith, um being on the core already, and made the Lothars already more familiar with them. And I think they sh I think Lord didn't really answer enough questions about how they're going to c conduct their work as justice. And... Just those three other candidates having been like more of a connection between the audience, I think that's just what set them apart. So I think there were no surprises there when the results were announced. Yeah, and that is a pretty important distinction that uh, I forgot to mention is that the uh, three people who did achieve a seat in this election were the incumbents, all of them. Uh, Laura was the only one who ran who wasn't already on the bench. You don't. Post the thread, you won't be elected. Well, as very, it, I understand the reasoning behind Lore's choice, i.e., I've been here before. I know what I'm doing. Y'all know what I'm doing. Vote for me. I understand why he's reluctant to write that for the ninth time on a campaign thread. But the formality is apparently important. Yeah, and I mean, Chipoli was correct in saying that Lore intentionally um, didn't post for it. He, 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 he forgot the traditional campaigning method. And I, I think when I asked him about it, his whole rationale that he posted as far as in the Citizens Channel was, you know, people either trust me or they don't. If they don't, then okay. But if they do, then cool. And, you know, I'll serve them and I'll, and I'll be a justice. So... I think Lore went for more of, like you were saying, I've been around the block, and if you trust me, then fantastic. 
if you think I'm going to do a good job, then be sure to vote for me. But otherwise, you know, there's not really, I don't think he necessarily made himself available to like the traditional method of campaigning where, you know, people post a platform, somebody gets asked questions as far as, hey, how do you feel about X and Y development? It was more just him, his candidacy was more just a persona, like in the sense that if you like Lore, if you like the work that Lore has done in the past, you vote for Lore. Otherwise, you know, there's not really much, I don't think, for voters to go off of. And I, and I think that that was by design, perhaps yep. to his detriment. But I, I do believe that uh, what what based on what we heard from him, that was by design. And along with that fact, he also uh, cited a lack of engagement in his voting threads, uh, quote unquote, not um, people aren't reading them. And so I believe it was not worth the effort um, from his point of view, posting the campaign thread when he um, has proven to be a, a fairly formidable justice and has been elected this position multiple times. So, um, and um, usually campaign threads during the judicial, um, excuse me, judicial elections um, don't get as much engagement as say general elections because usually candidates in the judicial election are more experienced and they know them and there's not as much questions. So Lord took a look at that and then he made his choice to not post the campaign thread um, based on those factors. But I don't think it ended up working out as him. Yeah, and I think, you know, when it comes to judicial elections, obviously it's important, as we've seen with the recent events, including r for and the court case, which we will get into um, later on in the show here in a bit. But I think, you know, it's it's not as... The word I kind of want to use is publicized. It's not as much of a spectacle in TNP. Um, obviously, it's a very important part of our identity as a democracy, but it's not necessarily something that people speculate about months in advance. It's a bit more low-key in that sense. And I think you even saw kind of that more lax element just when it when it came to the campaigning uh, period because Ghost got his campaigning thread out very early on the second, um, and then for the next five days he was he was the only one who had a campaign. Of course, later on in the in the span of the exact same day, we got attempted socialism's campaign, and then we got news campaign. But for the longest time, Ghost uh, of the four people running of the four candidates, Ghost was the only one who did have a campaign for people to, I guess, you know engage with so it doesn't necessarily surprise me even if that weren't the case but it doesn't necessarily surprise me given that that um he had the most uh the most amount of first preference ballots of course uh the second person the second candidate who achieved the most first rank ballots was elu and when we look at elu's campaign that also isn't particularly surprising to me um recently elu posted a application to join the regional bar and he put a, it's as it as it appears he put a lot of time and effort into that there's a lot of hyperlinks there's a lot of stuff that goes back you know even over a decade um and of course he's been here for all of that but his his justice thread was essentially his justice campaign was essentially hey go look at this any at your leisure anything that you like want to reference that i was either here for or that I participated in, it's all here. It's a nice compilation of all of that. So his justice thread was more, hey, go look at this other thread that I just posted not even, you know, that that long ago. Do you think uh, that was an effective use of a thread? Or do you wish he, maybe there was more some, more substance there? Dude, a Louvatar could have written vote for a Louvatar in a thread, and it would have done the exact, with, 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 a hyperlink to his admission to, to the bar, and it would have had the exact same effect. He wrote a novel on his campaign thread, and he got he got a total. It's it's funny to me. There is one reply to that thread. It is El Fiji Grande saying forty minutes after the OP, no, no questions. And that seemed to have summed up the regional's opinion on Aluvatar as a justice. Um, I mean, what would you ask him at that point? You know, he, he would have. I, you've seen everything from the dawn to the dusk of this region and in between. What could we possibly ask you that hasn't been asked? 
I mean, I think he's answered really every question there is to answer. He's right. Or he's been at some point involved in making said decisions. Yeah, in addition to, you know, that al- the compilation of everything he's been involved in that he included in his application to uh, be admitted to the bar, he also kind of provided his uh, outlook on the legal theory of the North Pacific, and he kind of just reaffirmed his stances on a few more fundamental things. Uh, it, it's always good to relitigate that, especially for some voters who may, might not be familiar with Elu's body of work. But um, if you're looking for, you know, justices who are well read up on the book, I don't think you can get much better than the guy who was there when not only the book was written, but when the uh, precursors to the books were also written. He's uh, he he's not only a turtle; he is the he is the ancient eternal turtle in this case. I'd say he's probably the most overqualified member that the bar will probably ever see. I mean, Elevator is just as perfect a uh, member of the of the bar as you can get. Like, you could not get any better than Elo Watcher. That's, that's what, that was my initial reaction when he posted his bar thread. This was, of course, prior to him posting his campaign. But my initial reaction was that, um, number one, there's no question that'll be admitted. Number two, uh, he may or may not be. And you know what? I won't even say may or may not. He is the most overqualified member of the bar uh, once he gets admitted. And that is that is not hyperbole. Like, um, he, he very much, like I said, was not only there when the book was written, had a hand in writing said book, but like, as far as the identity of how this entire judicial infrastructure has come about, not only is he very in tune with that, but, uh, you know, there's no, I don't, I don't think that there's anyone at this point in time who would know more just as instinctually as he would, because yeah, in addition to, I've been around the block, kind of like what Laura was saying. Uh, Elu, I don't know. Elu was there when the block was built, if that makes sense. So I, again, like Fiji said, no, no questions. I don't think you necessarily could have gone wrong, uh, by voting for Elu. And I believe that Elu has the joint record of being elected, um, elected the most times as justice. He has been elected, I think, eight times, um, the most out of anyone except Lord Dominator, who also was elected eight times. So that's a very impressive record there. Yeah, so what's really cool is that we can now confirm this. Um, I know that Ghost, Paleth, one of the candidates, has actually been keeping a list quite a while for some of the past elected officials and office holders. But earlier today, uh, Mad Jack also did a little bit of his own independent res- researches into the sum of that. And we got this uh, lovely spreadsheet where, yes, it is addressed to how many times, you know, X and Y has occurred and how many times people have been elected. And of this list, yeah, when you get to justice, um, Elu is, you know, not necessarily as up there as you would think in this listing, but it's definitely... Um, Actually, yeah, he is. Never mind. I'll retract that. He's He's been elected seven times, and the only one who really tops that is Lord Dominator, as you mentioned. This is an alphabetical list. I thought it was in order of um, how many times they've been elected. But yes, Elu is tied with uh, Yivit, which is another name. Lore also has seven times. And of course, uh, Ghost going down the list a bit fewer than them at five, but some very experienced candidates all around. People who, yeah, have been in the role before, very familiar with the court. So again, I think that even though Lore ended up being the odd man out, you really couldn't have gone wrong. So it's a strong crop of candidates as far as what you want out of a justice. Uh, somebody who's done it before, somebody who knows what they're doing, somebody who can who can write legible English. Yeah. Sorry, not us in three. <laughs> Well, I mean, those, those are always those are always good qualities to look for, especially um, if you trust the judgment skills of the people on the bench. And I and I think that you know, no matter who really who was the odd man out, I think that that could be said for all the candidates. So I think that we definitely you know got there, and this was a pretty um, pretty uncontroversial election, pretty uh, standard fare, but in a good way. In a good, way. it was a quiet election, but you know, it it got the job done for what we needed it to. So yeah. And of course, um, lest we leave out attempted socialism's campaign, 
which uh, was a bit a bit longer, I would say, than the other ones. But um, it was essentially talking about how um, he'd, he'd not planned to run for this third term. However, um, of course, he was nominated. And he, although the plan was to step down, uh, recent events that, of course, we're going to get into have revealed maybe some things that could be improved. And, of course, um, seeing that, he uh, felt compelled to get involved is what I would deduce from what he has said about it. So, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Even if you're not necessarily planning to, if somebody nominates you and you think you can do it. It's a fair enough reason, isn't he? And not to mention earlier, we want on about Lore, who um, was the odd one out about not being elected. Um, personally, I don't think it's because that Lore is not capable of being good justice. I think we just had a s- strong bunch of candidates here that um, somebody had to, somebody had to go. And unfortunately, I think it's not saying that he wasn't impressive. It's more saying that the others were more impressive than him. Right. There, yeah. like, there There's, again, with the, with the campaign thing, it could be as much of a formality as writing. I've written this exact campaign thread for now 11, 12 times. Like, I, I, I've done this before. I've been on the court. I've answered your questions. What do you want? What more? What more do you want? Elect me. It could be that simple. Um, and again, I understand why you don't want to do something like that. It could just be a waste of time, but it's an important formality in DNP from her firsthand experience. Yeah, uh, and in you know, Lore's been elected the exact same amount of times, like I mentioned before, as right. uh, you know, Elu and uh, Yevit. So, I mean, that's the other thing. It's completely plausible that in any other crop of candidates, Lore gets elected without issue. So it's not even it's not even that like there was some uh, discrepancy or deficiency between him and the other candidates. It's it's literally luck of the draw. You got four great candidates, solid candidates, who undoubtedly can do the job. It just so happened there's only three seats, which you know is a good problem to have. We'd rather have that problem than scrambling to try to figure out who's going to be filling a seat. You know, so yeah, I would say that's. Um, Lore is obvious. It would have been a formidable opponent, no matter what, um, at this point. And it just—it was just one of those elections where you know somebody's got to be the odd. And I think that campaign thread really made a difference. You know, just going that extra mile to post a campaign thread. You know, you can have the simplest of campaign threads, as Bob was talking about earlier. The way. It genuinely as makes makes a difference, and I think it has proven this election to make a difference. And I think it's an important lesson: just put that little bit of effort, go the extra mile, and I think it'll take you to a lot of, of good places. It definitely ticks the box. I feel like just obligatory, so obligatorily. So is that is that the word for that? Um, it just ticks the box in the minds of voters: Do they have a campaign? Are they making the effort to make a campaign? I think maybe even if you're abundantly qualified, just the fact that you would do so. I mean, you still see Elu writing campaigns. You still see uh, a former chief justice writing campaigns. Uh, you still see incumbents okay. writing campaigns. So it's like, why not? Um, I think what was interesting is just out of the campaigns that we did get from the three candidates who posted them, they all kind of offered something a little bit different. Elu's was more referencing his past body of work. Um, Paleith's was more... I'm here for questions. Ask me things because I'm willing to do it again. And uh, attempted socialisms was more, I feel like, presenting his outlook on things or projects he might be interested in. I feel like of the of the platforms that we got, that was the one that, you know, addressed perhaps new ideas with the court clerk position, um, how we can better get people engaged with the court and the judicial process. I feel like that was the campaign that presented the most ideas or at least thought provoking questions of, hey, what should we do? Whereas the other two, it was more based on not only name recognition, but just past body of work. And so that is something important to remember that attempted socialism does not have nearly as much history in TNP as 
Ghost and Elu. Um, I think he came here in August of 2022. And, you know, he has a, a lot more to prove. And I think it's right for someone newer like him to just look towards the future instead of the past, maybe present some ideas on on the court, uh, maybe get the, um, maybe just, you know, activate the minds of the voters, you know, get them thinking, you know, I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, and and you know you you were correct in August of 2022. I did uh, look it up here for reference, but um, that's the other thing that that wasn't even that long ago. It's actually under a year ago, and yet it honestly, to me at least, feels as though he's been here all along on the court, which is a good sign. Um, yeah, I I don't think that the novelty of being new or lesser experienced happened to really factor into this. Um, by the numbers, it definitely didn't seem to factor into this, but even just like in the minds of the average voter, I don't necessarily think that was something that was either a detracting factor. I think the only way that that really proved as an advantage is in Elu's case, which is just, I mean, everyone knows that Elu has been uh, around, like I was mentioning, for pretty much always. I think that was the only really thing as far as time relation that played a part as far as being an advantage. But I don't think that time served was a detractor for any of these uh, candidates, considering they were all abundantly experienced. No, the all of these candidates are and were and will be known commodities. We know what we're getting from them. This is not. This is not breaking new ground here. Yep. All right, and so the second portion of our broadcast, moving on is going to be just sort of an update on the North Pacific versus St. George, a.k.a. Mad Jack court case. Last time we were on NBS, uh, the indictment was just getting filed. And, uh, you know, it was it was just now becoming a thing with some opening statements. We kind of speculated on where the uh, defense might be going. And since that broadcast, a fair bit has happened um, in the natural progression of things. We saw a member of the defense team step down. Uh, there was a lengthy post posted on the forums about, you know, just generally um, how we as a region should treat judicial affairs when it comes to people acting potentially in not the best faith. That was a discussion and dialogue that was started by Cretox. Um, and then later on, of course, we kind of entered into another phase of the court case, which wasn't so much arguing back and forth between the prosecution and defense but was more so them reaching a, a plea agreement through cooperation in which uh, a plea of no contest was entered, which is not necessarily something that always happens. It's something that can happen, but it's not the most common type of plea. Usually you're either pleading guilty or you're pleading not guilty. In this case, the deal essentially um, uh, boiled down to a criminal act was committed. However... The defendant is pleading not necessarily guilty to that act. However, it, it's a bit it's a bit of a you know having your cake and eating it too, in a way, um, of the defense admitting that a criminal act did happen. So they're admitting it happens, but they're not necessarily admitting guilt for that. And they are two different things, as we've come to find out. So in that plea agreement, um, the prosecution and the court did end up accepting that. But the prosecution and the defense came to that resolution together, and so we proceeded to sentencing recommendations, in which both sides gave their recommendations, possible mitigating factors, what the plea meant, statement of facts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The chart, um, the, the the really important detail to make is that the charge was altered; it is no longer espionage. The prosecution opted to charge the defendant with one count of gross misconduct, which in our past broadcast was actually something that I mentioned as a possibility of might ha of that could happen. So in a way, I kind of feel like I spoke it into existence because I was talking about, hey, what if you downgrade this to a gross misconduct charge as opposed to espionage? And it actually turned out that the prosecution ended up doing it. So I'm not necessarily sur sure if that was part of the plea agreement, but it is something that happened and it definitely changed the optics of the court case. Uh, what do you guys think is the main significance of that? What did that indicate to you when the charge was in a way downgraded to gross misconduct? What I believe is that it's more of a reflection of like the, the alleged crime that he committed. 
because what he in question is being uh, tried for, um, Matt Jack accused the European president Rand at the president at the time Rand of spying on its ally, the rejected realms, um, via an agent that infiltrated um, TRR citizens chat and relayed messages back to the president, which was then later used to confront uh, Gorondo um, about a certain uh, TMP official's position on Europeus um, entering of the Aegis Accords, which is a treaty between um, defender aligned regions. And the argument that's being made is that Magic broke his oath and in his capacity as advisor to the delegate, had, he had access to that information and he therefore leaked it into the public, which is no, not a good thing to do. And so gross misconduct coming to espionage, espionage suggests that he was, you know, maybe doing some spying, but the gross misconduct more suggests that he abused his power to make that information public, which is, you know, more, I think more accurate in the context of the case. Yeah, and another thing worth mentioning is that obviously gross misconduct, if convicted, uh, gives you a lesser penalty or a less severe penalty than being convicted of espionage. Uh, as far as the sentencing recommendations, the prosecution submitted a sentencing recommendation that would include the suspension of voting rights for a period of three months. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that's the bare minimum that they can give you for being convicted of that crime. There. The legal minimum, I believe, is however is quote however long the court sees fit. Okay, so that so in the penal code, that's oh, it could mean. theoretic. So it could theoretically be one minute, which was the defense recommendation. Well, before that was stricken from well, the record. Well, before it was officially stricken from the record, that is correct. So in the aforementioned plea agreement, I may as well um, while we're on the subject reading what the defense and the prosecution agreed to. So obviously they dismissed the charge of espionage like I was talking about and replaced it with the charge of gross misconduct. They strike the evidence submission um, relating to logs from the Office of the Delegate Channel on Discord. Those logs were submitted as part of evidence that was tossed out. The prosecution and defense agreed to the inclusion of the dispatch that MJ published. Um, so definitely that was kept in as part of the evidence. There was claims by the defense um, asking for, you know, the recusal of temporary hearing officers, GBM and Oracle, a.k.a. Artemis. That was later dropped. Um, they waived any conflict claims regarding that. So the defense understands that waiving conflict would preclude an appeal based on the conflict of those. So the temporary hearing officers were, um, you know, there was no claim of any conflict there. The prosecution accepted the defense's plea of no contest. And they submitted a joint recommendation for three months, suspension of voting rights. And they just basically, they each separately submitted a statement that included, you know, the facts that the, what the court should consider. But the joint recommendation was three months. So it, it's incredibly likely that that is going to end up being the punishment. Um, which, you know, in a way, I would say is definitely um, a more amicable result compared to what could have happened had you been committed, had the defendant been uh, convicted of espionage. I think that three months for that is, you know, pretty reasonable. Pretty reasonable, I would say. And this also means that Magic will not be able to vote in the September uh, 2023 general election. Yes. And possibly, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a ju judicial election coming up after that, which I'm quite fairly certain he won't be able to cast his vote. He, November. Yeah. He would be he would, he would be eligible to vote at, in November. Yeah. So in November he can. In September, if convicted, he could not. And usually for charges of gross misconduct, that also results in removal from um your office stage, which is not quite specified and has been a subject of debate recently, but prior to that he is mad he no longer holds any right results. so as we were talking about in the last five yeah. from his position so he was signed as minister of culture and more more poorly at as the advisor to the delegate so that punishment would now 
no longer make any really sense, really. Yeah, that that punishment isn't necessarily applicable, considering that Manchek removed himself from the office that he held um, by resigning as advisor to the delegates. So, as far as you know, being removed from it, that's sort of uh, not needed, considering that he's already removed himself. As far as like the separate statements that they issued, there was a period offered by moderating Justice Elu, in which he asked you know both the prosecution and the defense if they wanted to submit rebuttals. Neither side. Um, in indicated that they wanted a rebuttal. So the defense first said, we don't intend to file a rebuttal. And of course, the prosecution followed that up with, um, they also don't intend to file a rebuttal. So right now, uh, as of as of about noon central time today, um, ELO posted that the court is deliberating and that every effort is being made to uh, reach a good and swift ruling. A timeline was given by Elu in which he apologizes for not necessarily following it to the letter. Um, but they've they've issued a deadline of July the 16th. So by July the 16th, coming up here in a few days, we will figure out um, what's going on. But yeah, the, the moderating justice has indicated that by the 16th, which um, looking at it would be this coming Sunday, we will have an answer to the question of uh, whether or not Mad Jack will be sentenced to those three months of suspended voting rights, which in all likelihood, that seems like, you know, a foregone conclusion at this point. But yeah, as, over the course of the court case, is there any like added commentary that you guys wanted to provide? Is there anything that you found particularly interesting or that you might want to dispute? No, everything in there seemed factual. Yeah, I think the main thing is that it took us a while to reach this, um, but... You yes, know, the obviously... court case did drag a while. But mm. you'd you'd rather have that and it render, like, an accurate, fair judgment, I would say, as opposed to just, like, speed speed running a court case. I don't... I agree. Right, I don't think necessarily that speed running would be conducive to justice being served, so I think that... I don't think that... Pretux doing whatever the hell he did is necessarily conducive to justice either, but these these are unprecedented circumstances, and it did point out mechanical and cultural flaws in TNP as a whole. So I'm kind of excited to see um, how the court will adapt to that in future cases. Yeah. And that's one of the things that attempted socialism, I think, in his campaign was talking yes. about just generally. Yes. I remember how, reading how, about that. How they address that. And, you know, early on, I think over the course of this case, we saw the defense do some interesting, more unconventional things. But I think, you know, the, the falling action by the end, we got to a more, um, I don't want to say sensible, because that, that indicates that at a time it wasn't. But I think a more uh, predictable behavior as far as the defense. So it, it, it kind of died a lot down with the um, theatrics of it or something like that. Yeah, theatrics is a decent word. Yeah, I think I think that works for what we want it to work for. So, yeah. Chipotle, you were about to say something? Quite curious about this. Um, well, I just wanted to get your opinions on whether um, the court um, came to the right decision or not. Is the penalty of three months suspension from voting rights just fair or... Was it not harsh enough, or was it too harsh? Uh, when it comes to anything like this, it depends on the optics you're looking through. If you truly believe that a wrong was committed and that MJ, you know, deserves to, you know, atone for that wrong that was committed in your mind, that it would it would serve to reason that you would think that maybe this was a bit too lenient. Whereas if you think, you know, Matt Jack's actions were justified and that this needed to be brought to the public's attention then, you know, obviously you might think this is either appropriate or that he shouldn't even face punishment at all. That that could be a viewpoint that some people might have. But I think that this is a decently happy medium for that because, again, the defense did admit that a criminal act occurred. So I think after that admission, three months is all in all not that bad. Uh, not being able to vote for a general election is, is going to sting a bit. Um, but outside of that i would say it's a pretty fair judgment if that ends up being the case yeah i believe it could have been far worse so i think magic won't be too displeased with the outcome yeah i think dryton uh, in particular who stayed on the defense team did a decent job of that getting to that resolution 
Alrighty then. Well, thank you uh, both to our live audience and anyone listening on their own time when this is uploaded later on uh, for listening to us in this news report on NBS. As always, if you enjoy our content, then be sure to stay tuned for the next broadcast. This has been Ropes, Bob, and Chipoli signing off.